morning, I, if you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Genesis chapter 18. And the message God has given me, it, it has to do with something so important, so important. It has to do with something called influence. Can you say that with me? Say influence. Something called influence. I want to talk to you out of Genesis 18 in verse 1. And, and I want to talk to you about the type of influence that God gives us as his leaders, as his people. It reads like this in verse 16. It says, then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham, everybody say Abraham. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Say it loud. Say Abraham. Abraham. Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Now notice in verse 17. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. It says, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. They may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice and that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grave. He says, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it and that has come to me. And if not, I will know. And then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But look at what the Bible says. It says, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Say, Abraham prayed. And Abraham came near and said, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous in the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? And he begins to talk to God. He begins to stand in the gap. He begins to pray. He begins to intercede. And he says, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, Lord. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Thank you. This morning, I want to talk to you about a powerful word. I want to talk to you about influence. You know, a great leader that once walked this earth said this powerful statement. He said, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. The great author on prayer, A.W. A. Tozer, said, a frightened world needs a fearless church. I believe, Victor Eric San Diego, we are those fearless people. We are those people who walk without fear. We know that a fearless church is made up and built by fearless men and fearless women who know their God. The Bible says they that know their God will do great and mighty things. Now, we're living in a time, we're living in a land of influencers. This is the time we are in. The other day, I was kind of just messing around and uh, filling out this application. And they asked me, you know, what do you do? What do you do for a living? Now, they didn't have anything for pastor there, you know, on the, on the application because I am a pastor. But as I was scrolling through those different job titles, I, I noticed one that said influencer. And I thought to myself, I said, dude, that's a job now. <laughs> that's a job now. You could get paid for just doing stuff on your phone, just taking selfies. There's a job. You could get paid for just taking selfies. But when I really begin to think about what influencers do is, is really what they do is they, they, they bridge people. They promote, they promote products. They try to use their influence to gear people towards products and services. They use their looks. They use their talent. They use their ability to bridge people, to, to influence people towards things. And as I was thinking about that, I asked myself this question, and I ask you the same thing is, where are the God influencers? Where are the people that are bridging the loss towards the love of Jesus? See, I, I may be a pastor, but I look at my own profession as an influencer. I'm influencing people towards the promises of God. Amen. I'll clap for myself. Yeah, you're doing a good job, pastor. See, God people, spiritual leaders are not ordinary leaders. They're, they're men and women who hear God 
They hear God. They hear the voice of God for their generation. They hear the voice of God for their family. They hear the voice of God for a dying people. And God people are not ordinary people because, watch this, they're willing to step out on what they've heard. That's what Abraham did. He was the friend of God, and when he heard that God was going to bring judgment to that great city, he didn't sit back, but he stepped up and he stepped out. Why do God's people step out for others? Is because we've got a power that the world does not have. We have an authority that the world does not have. We have an influence that the world seeks. We have a confidence from God. And, and, I, and I think many of us would say in this place that we are grateful to God. And because of that, that's given us not a selfish spirit, but a selfless spirit. A selfless spirit. God is going to judge the city. He's going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. When you study this city, you, you notice that their sins were very grave. They were very dark, very dark sins, great sins. It kind of like reminds you of, of the times that we live in here. The great Billy Graham, the great evangelist said, if God does not judge the United States of America, he will have to apologize to Sodom. We're living in a time, guys. And I think as a church, we need to wake up. We're living in a very dark time, church. We got to wake up. I'll say it again. We got to wake up. We've got to wake up to the sin and the things that are happening around us. Judgment is coming. And, and I'm not a doomsday preacher. I'm not here to bring another dark cloud over your life. But I'm here to open up your eyes today. See, God reveals his plans to Abraham. Why did God reveal it to Abraham? And why will God reveal his plans to us? Because Abraham and God were partners. Do you know that's the privilege we have? Do you know that you're not just a son and daughter of the Most High, but you're a partner with God? And he spoke to Abraham because he said to Abraham, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a people, and your sons and daughters are going to follow you, and I'm going to use your life. See, God doesn't do anything in the earth, brothers and sisters, until he first reveals it to his servants. Judgment was in the heart of God. He was going to bring judgment on that city, but he didn't move until he first revealed it to Abraham. That's what a spiritual leader is. What is a spiritual leader? A spiritual leader is somebody that can hear the voice of God. Hear the voice of God for the times they're living in. Hear the voice of God for their family. Hear the voice of God for their church. Hear the voice of God for whatever it is that God has called them to do. And let me tell you something about a spiritual leader is that when God begins to reveal spiritual things to spiritual leaders, we should listen. We should listen. See, a spiritual leader, what does he do? He doesn't just hear from God, but he also steps up and steps out for God. What I, what I love about Abraham here in this story, and, and I, I just feel this is such an important message, especially for those of you that love God. How many of you love God? How many of you love Jesus? How many love to serve Jesus? How many of you hear from the Lord? You hear things from the Lord. Well, here's what Abraham did. Abraham didn't just hear the Lord, but he was willing to stick his neck out. Where, where are the people that are willing to stick their neck out for others? Where are the people that are willing to take a risk, willing to put their own life on the line? You see, a spiritual leader is somebody who has not only influence with God, but influence with people. A spiritual leader is someone who's willing to do what others are unwilling to do. A, a spiritual leader is someone willing to step up and to stand in the gap. I believe that a, a spiritual leader is, is like a bridge, is like a bridge. They're willing to bridge people to the goodness of God. That's what leadership is. That's what real, what, what does God give us power for? Why are we asking God for power? Power is not for the purpose of status. It's for the purpose of service. He gives us power so that we could be a bridge for hurting people. What, what does a bridge do? A bridge is something that moves, moves people. A, a bridge is something that moves us from here to there. It gives us access to new territory. I love the beautiful Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge was completed in 1883, and the first, it, it was the first su suspension bridge of its kind. John Augustus Roebling was the designer, the engineer, and the visionary of the Brooklyn Bridge, but he died early in construction. His foot was pinned between a footing, 
and he died. So his son, Washington Roebling, 32 years old, he also rose up to take on the project, but he died at 32. He was unable to finish it. It wasn't until the mother, Emily Warren Roebling, the wife of Augustus, John Augustus Roebling, rose up to the challenge of finishing that bridge. And guess what? Over 100 years later, that bridge is still standing. That bridge is still standing. See, what am I saying is that when God begins a work, he looks for someone who will finish it. He's begun a work in some of you. He's, become a, he's begun a work in this church. He's begun a work in your family. He's begun a work in your life. But there, there's, there's, there's something that God wants to finish. And guess who God wants to use? He wants to use us to finish that work. God is looking for men and women in this very moment, in this very hour. I want to shout so loud right now. I want to scream this right now. I want to scream this to all of San Diego and all of Victory Outreach and all the churches of the world. God is looking for men and women that will come out of their comfort zone and be a bridge to hurting and dying people and people who are lost. Where are those that are willing to stick their neck out? Where are those Abrahams that have heard from the Lord? Where are those Sarahs that have heard from the Lord? Where are those Marys that have heard from the Lord? Where are those Davids? Listen, this is your moment to rise up and to let people know that this is not the end. This is just the beginning. Come. Put your hand in your heart. Say, I am that messenger. Say, I'm that bridge. See, what, what is a bridge? A bridge moves people from the enemy's plan to God's plan. That's why the Savior, write this down, the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, is the bridge. Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is our bridge to the Father. He, he, he's our bridge. He's the only one who can bridge us to eternal life. He's the only one that can bridge us to salvation. How many are grateful for your salvation? I think there's, there's moments in our walk with God where we've got to stop and get grateful. We've got to stop and we've got to just start being grateful that he delivered us. Start being grateful that he healed us. Come on, somebody. Where would we be without Jesus? I feel like shouting this part, too. Where would we be without Jesus? Where would we be without the blood of Jesus? I know where I would be. I would, I'd be dead or I'd be in prison. So I'm grateful that the Savior laid down his life for me, and he bridged me from darkness into his marvelous life. He broke the curse of sin. He broke generational curses. He broke the curse of addiction. He broke the curse of poverty. He broke the curse of not having any vision. Come on, who could be grateful in this moment? Come on, who's grateful for Jesus? Brothers and sisters, listen, he did not only bridge us to eternal life, but the Bible says he bridged us to abundant life. In the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10, it says the thief comes not except to steal, kill, and destroy. You remember that season of your life, don't you, where you couldn't get a win. You were always hurting. It seemed like you were always being ripped off. Talk to me, somebody. Well, maybe some of you were ripping people off. But whatever the case may be. You remember what it was to be robbed and beaten by a thief. But Jesus said, I came to give life. I came to give life and life. Life there, life here. Life that is abundant, an overcoming life. A vic That's why if you're a believer, you should be living in victory. You should be living in joy. You should be praising him the loudest, thanking him the most. Someone's got to stir it up this morning and say, I've got the abundant life. I've got Double, I got a double life sentence in Jesus. That, that abundant life gives you influence because it makes your life contagious. Don't you understand that your life is contagious? Your life is supposed to rub, up on, rub off on other people. Come on, you don't want to say nothing to me. Come on, you that hungry? Come on, fire up your spirit. Your life ought to rub off on other people. Your life ought to influence other people. Come on, you're not called to be some dark in some dark corner hiding what God is doing. It's time for you to come out of the closet this year and say, I got the abundant life. I've got the double life sentence. I've got the double joy. I've got the double victory. I've got the double blessing. That's what gives you influence. 
That's why people are so shocked when movie stars, you know, tragically take their own life. That's why the world is so shocked when, you know, these influencers, these people that you see on TikTok and these different things. Can I speak to this generation? And everybody's so shocked. And what they do is when someone dies, they post about it. But they don't change. They don't change. Just keep on copying what they're, what they're doing. And people are shocked. Why? Because on the surface, it looks like they got it all together. Come on. Now, on the surface, they look like they got double life. But they don't know that there's some death brewing inside of them. What, I, what, I, what God is looking for is men and women that are going to break out of this church and let people know that the only way to have real joy and to re- have real life, come on, somebody, and to have real abundance is, come on, so you got to serve Jesus. Jesus is the bridge. He's the one. He's the one that's able to take you into his promises. I think people need to know how powerful the cross is. Is, is the cross powerful? I don't think we preach the cross enough. I think we preach vision a lot and hope a lot and about the promises a lot. But why is it that if we have so much vision, we produce such low quality Christians? That's too strong for you? I think someone that's encountered Jesus is a high quality person. And I'll tell you why. Because they understand the power of the cross. They understand that the cross is more powerful than what you know. In fact, John wrote in John 10, 10 that he came to give life and abundantly. But he also said in 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose, the son of man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Do you understand how powerful the cross of Jesus, how powerful of a bridge that is? Do you understand how powerful the blood of Jesus is? Do you understand how powerful, right, right? Let me tell you how powerful the cross is. The cross disarmed and stripped the devil of his power over your life. The cross disarmed. He took the weapons out of the hands of the devil. He snatched the keys of death, hell in the grave. That means de- depression is not your portion. Fear is not your portion. Defeat is not your portion. You've been given double life. You've been given double. Oh, man, I'm getting excited. I- I'm feeling like God is getting ready to do something new. We've got the victory. And I- I'll tell you what the cross says. The cross says there are miracles. The bridge says you can come out of your situation and come into a miracle. You can come into a miracle. That's the power. Jesus is the bridge. Also, secondly, you know, Abraham heard from God and he stood in for the people. But what we find with Abraham is that the Savior is not only the bridge, but here's a big word. Supplication is the bridge. Supplication. Do you know that Abraham was the first intercessor. The, 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 the big church, the big C, all of Victory Hour, just talking about prayer, talking about being a watchman. But you know that Abraham was the first intercessor of the Bible. And you know what an intercessor is? You know what an intercessor is? An intercessor is someone who steps up after the bad news. You know, anybody can pray when it's good. Anybody could pray when everybody's healthy. Anybody could sing when there's victory in the house. Anybody, it's, it's kind of easy to see things from the mountaintop. <laughs> but you, can you keep a praying spirit? Come on, somebody. When bad news has come. Woo, I want to talk to some real prayer warriors. I'm not talking about showboats in the house of God, people that show up for prayer, but nothing's happening. I'm talking about people that are trying to move stuff. Ah, come on and help me preach this a little bit. I want to talk to some real praying leaders, some real spiritual leaders, some high quality believers. I want to talk to some people that you don't get to praying until you find out somebody's sick. That's when you come alive. You're like, oh, yeah. This is the time to start seeing miracles. 
See, the Lord said the judgment's coming. Tell your neighbor, judgment's coming. And he says, I can't do it without talking to my friend. This is powerful. He said, I've got to let my friend know or else he's going to be surprised. And I've given him a promise that he's going to be the father of many nations, that his children and his descendants are going to follow after him. His, his descendants are going to be as, as many as the stars. He says, so I, I've got to let my friend know. That's what prayer is. It's God letting his friends know. Let my friend know. He says, should I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? And here's what we learn here is judgment's never a surprise. That's what God's showing us here. Judgment's never a surprise. When bad things happen, it's never a surprise. <laughs> the problem is sometimes we don't listen. We don't listen. We, we don't listen to the voice of God. And, and, and I think this is so important that that God always provides a grace period for change. He says, this is going to happen, but I want to give you an opportunity to change. Now, this may not be the most peppy point, but this could be the most powerful point. Because what God is saying to some of us here, in fact, the reason why you're here is because you're saying it's time for me to change. It's time for me to change. People who are friends with God, they hear things from God because God reveals his plans to them. And you know what a spiritual leader does? Ooh, this is good. They don't keep it to themselves. That's what I realized that being a preacher is. I'm just up here and I'm not keeping nothing to myself. I'm, I'm preaching to you what God has shown me. I'm sharing with you. Hey, listen, let, let's get strong here. Hey, we're weak here. Hey, we got to watch out for this. That's a shepherd. Can I hear an amen? But what, but what about you? What about you who pray? What about you who spend time with God? Are you keeping it to yourself? Or are there people that God wants you to speak to? When's the last time you went to that unsaved loved one and said, your time to change is now? Come on, clap in this place. Clap. I know you're getting a little convicted, but it's all right. Come on. When's the last time you stepped up and stuck your neck out? And said, I know you're probably not going to like what I'm going to say to you, but because I love you, God showed me something about your life. You, if you keep going this route, you're going to die. If you keep going this route, you're going to be broken. If you keep going this route, you're going to end up in hell. And I'm the messenger of God this morning, and I came to bridge you to the Savior and let you know there is power in the cross. There is power to change. And I, and I came to talk to my church this morning and tell you I can't be the only messenger. I can't be the only preacher. I can't be the only evangelist. I can't be the only disciple maker. God is looking to raise up some intercessors, some people who pray, but you will not stay silent. You're going to raise your voice from the mountaintop and say, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. But he's given us an opportunity to respond to his voice. Somebody clap like you, come on, clap like you believe it. This is tough stuff, but how many think we got to go to another level? Come on, clap like you believe that. We've got the message. We've got the message. We are the bridge. We are the ones. Especially if you pray, you can't keep it to yourself. See, intercessors, people who's, who are in supplication prayer, they're the first to know from God. Also, they're the first to influence God. Notice what Abraham did. He went to God. He says, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? That takes a lot of boldness. That takes a lot of boldness to attempt to turn the heart of God. But I could tell you that he did turn the heart of God. He did turn the heart of God because the Lord, he was going to just go ahead and do it. But Abraham caused the Lord to pause. And he said, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Read the story. It is so amazing. And, and he goes, no. He goes, he, he, if there were 50 in the land, would you do it? He said, no. He goes, okay, let's negotiate. If there were 40 in the land. 
and he took it all the way down to 10. The sad part, the sad part, the sad part is there still wasn't even 10. <laughs> but here's the good news. There's a space for grace. <laughs> There's a space for grace. There's a space for negotiation. You can get down before God and say, God, I know it's bad, but you're the one that's able to intervene. I know it's bad, but I know you could be more patient. I know it's... Oh, come on and clap this morning. Help me. I feel the Holy Ghost speaking to somebody. There's a space for grace. There's a space for intercession. There's a space for supplication, but God is looking for someone that's going to negotiate. He's looking for somebody that's going to be a bridge. Someone that's going to stick their neck out in prayer. Someone that's not going to be silent. And, and this is the final point before we pray. We're building a bridge to lost and hurting people. The Savior is the bridge. Sub supp supplication is the bridge. But lastly and finally, and this is the big one here, and this is the one I pray every one of us will respond to this morning. Submission is the bridge. Yeah. Nothing happens until someone submits. There's so much pride in the church. There's so much pride in the house of God. And on, on Friday night at our prayer meeting, I said, you know, the, the, pride is destructive. Pride hinders miracles. But you know that pride also halts the work of God. Lucifer was an angel in heaven. And he exhibits the first instance of pride when he reached for God, he reached for equality with God, but he slipped and fell. And he was cast out of heaven because of pride. Somebody say pride. pride. But Jesus, who had equality with God, he already had it. The Bible says he humbled himself as a servant. He humbled himself as a servant even in one instance, to wash the feet of his disciples. And his disciples said, oh, no, Lord, don't wash my feet. You know, he goes, if I don't wash your feet, you can't be clean. And then Peter said, well, then wash my whole body. <laughs> Nothing happens in the kingdom of God until someone's willing to put down their pride and submit. God called Jonah. God called Jonah as they play to go to Nineveh, to, to go to Nineveh and to preach against that city. He was going to destroy that city. And he called Jonah to go to that city, the prophet, and to cry out against that great city. He says, I'm going to destroy it. Remember, God doesn't do anything without first revealing it to his people. He said, I want you to go and cry out that great city and tell them to repent, tell them to change. And the Bible says that Jonah ran. Why did Jonah run? Why did he run? He didn't run because he was afraid. He ran because he was prejudiced. He ran because he didn't like those people. He didn't like those Assyrians. He despised them for what they did to God's people. But imagine that no matter what those people did, to God's people, the Lord was still willing to forgive them. And the Bible says that he bought a ticket and he fled on a ship to Tarshish. And you know the rest of the story. The Lord had to get his attention. I, I, understand me, brothers and sisters, that there's this gap between the lost and this gap between the church. And there's this gap between father and, and son and mother and daughter. And there's this gap this blaring gap that the only way it could be closed is when someone uses their influence to bridge people to the love of God. When somebody says, I'm going to be a God influencer. I'm going to influence people to the loss. I'm going to influence people towards the promise. And what we find here is that when Jonah finally answered the call of God, and I believe this is going to happen for some of you. I believe it. When he finally answered the call of God, he went to preach against Nineveh. And you know what happened? He, he thought they were all going to kill him. He thought they were going to crucify him. They thought they were going to put a pin through his nose and drag him by a horse. They thought that they were going to tear him from limb to limb. But when he went to Nineveh to preach, the opposite happened. The Bible said the whole city repented. 
the whole city got on their face and said, we've got to change. Oh, man. Someone's waiting for you to submit. Someone's waiting for you to turn your whole life over to God already. Someone's waiting for you to come under God's plan to be that committed believer, to be that obedient believer. Now, there might not be a lot of shouts this morning, but that's okay. That's okay because God is looking for people who will hear his heart. God is looking for men and women who will submit themselves to the plan of God that will be willing not just to pray, but to preach, to get out into the highways and the hedges and to compel them to give their life to Jesus. What is this thing about? What is church about? What, what is this thing about? So that you could just come in, hear a sermon, drink a cup of coffee and go home and be the same? Can I just be real this morning? I mean, what is this thing about? So you can come and just show off your outfit on a Sunday and flex on everybody and just be popular and get more followers. Is that what this thing's about? Or is this about seeing lives transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost? Come on, help your pastor preach. What is church all about? What is this vision all about? What is this ministry all about? We're, we're, we're not called to people leave people the same way God found them. He'll take you the way you are, but he loves you too much to keep you that way. There are levels to life. There's levels to life. There's levels to the calling of God. But what we need this morning, as I, as I want, have everybody stand. Everyone stand. You know, you know how we'll get it done? We're not going to get it done through ordinary Christians. We're not going to get it done through low-quality Christians. People that haven't had an encounter with Jesus. People that haven't, haven't encountered Jesus personally. Now, I know we have some people here for the first time. And if you, if you want to get saved, this is the day to get saved. Do not delay. The, the day, today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. This is the day. You're going to turn your life over to Jesus. I'm going to give you that opportunity in a minute. But before we do that, I, I feel in my spirit that I have to pray for those of you that call yourself influencers. What are you doing? Have you lost your way? Have you become so religious that you just go on a fast or you just pray, you just go to the next Christian meeting and you just shout and jump and go home and do nothing? What are you doing? Where are the souls? Where are the miracles? Where are the people that are turning their life over to Jesus? You got the message in your mouth and it's time for you to answer the call to influence people for the Lord. Where are you leader? Where are you Abraham? Where are you prophet of God? Where are you? Where are you? Who's following you? Who are you bringing to the house of God? Maybe you're bitter. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're hurt. Well, join the club. Maybe you don't like this or like that. Well, join the club. I don't like everything about my own church, but I still show up and preach. Because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for him. And there's a cloud of witnesses that say, Al, when you feel like giving up, it's worth it. Keep on preaching. Keep on loving. Keep on believing. Keep on, uh, keep on giving your best. Keep on reaching. So even if one gets saved, that's all it takes. Just one to get saved.